Hey guys, today I'm going to show you a game played by a student of mine who is a relative beginner to chess, rated around 600. And what caught my eye about this game was that they were able to create really beautiful opportunities for themselves just by following sound opening principles and fighting for the initiative. So the sphere of beauty in chess is not only relegated to the upper echelons of the chess world and you can learn to create that in your games as well. So let's get to it. The game began as a Sicilian defense, e4, c5. Um, the first few moves were pre-selected by me because I wanted the students to practice a certain kind of position. So I chose for them the open Sicilian. This is a con variation that black is playing. If you're wondering what is up with those pawn moves for black, like why are they moving pawns instead of developing pieces? Well, one pawn has opened up one bishop and helps control the center. And the other pawn move is possibly going to be helping the other bishop get developed to the long diagonal on the board that is called a bishop fianchetto in chess. So even the side pawn move really does have to do with the development of pieces for black as well as controlling this square in general because white's pieces like to use b5 as well. And now f4. And this is where we finish with my pre-selected moves and the students start playing on their own. Why did I want them to play this position and especially playing with this rather unusual pawn move f4? which is not the main move in this position. The main move actually is uh, bishop d3 or knight to c3. Um, but the move f4 is a very typical move in the Sicilian as a whole for white. It, it reinforces white's control over the center, gives white play on the king side as well. The only thing that's unusual about it is that it's coming very early on in the game before white has even castled, and therefore white does need to watch out for moves like queen to h4, but thankfully they have a very effective block, so there's really no reason for the black queen to come out. And black goes with another check. A uh, very natural instinct, I would say, for new players is to, you know, look for any check they can and you know, really to play, play it, right? As you get better in chess, you learn that not every check is that effective. Like for example, bishop b4, not super effective because white can always block with a pawn. They can also block with a knight or a bishop. And actually white chose this move, inviting black to capture and to double up white's pawns. And that is what black did. It was probably not the best decision. Um, and the pin should have been kept while black finally gets in some peace development, but black rushed in with a trade. They doubled up white's pawns, but they lost a bishop in the trade. And as you can see at the moment, black has no peace development at all. I would also point to their dark squares being fairly weak and they really need to watch out for the power of white's dark squared bishop, given that they're missing their own dark squared bishop. And now black proceeds to commit an also a very typical beginner mistake. They bring out their knight, attacking the e-pawn, but without really appreciating that the pawn can move forward. And this is a very annoying move by white because white is taking space with a tempo, gaining time on the black knight. Now the instinct for black should have been to look at the center squares and uh, think about moving his knight to one of these, although they're not perfect either and the knight can get disturbed from either of them. But black played knight g8. Yes, this is a very unattractive move. You don't really want to be undeveloping your pieces. I mean, we've made eight moves in the game so far and black has no pieces out. And white continues developing, right? So we like that about white's play. So we have you know, white has taken the opportunity to seize more control in the center. White has uh, developed their bishop in a really nice diagonal. I really like that. It's a lot more active than the other one because it points straight at 
uh, black's kink side, right? Bishops love those open diagonals. Okay, so black tries to catch up in development, castles and castles. Okay. And now white plays the move f5. So I completely agree with the spirit of this move, guys. I think it shows that white is um, in an aggressive mode, right? They're trying to open up files and diagonals. Um, you know, like, for example, maybe another typical move would be something moving this bishop somewhere, right? That would be like more of a mundane move. And I'm pretty happy that white's not even bothering with that because a bishop is a piece that is actually partially developed from its starting position. As long as it's not being blocked by pawns, you often don't really have to develop a bishop because it already has access to so many squares. So instead of making that sort of routine development, white is doing something more aggressive. Now I should point out to you guys that there is a really much more advanced um, continuation here for white. And it is reminiscent of something that we call the Greek gift sacrifice in chess. So if white uh, wanted to, they could sacrifice their bishop on h7. So if you were wondering about that, yes, it is possible. Um, in fact, any move that is a check and that pulls out the opponent's king to a more open position should be looked at. And then you bring in your queen. So the reason this is not like a typical Greek gift is that there is no knight that is coming to g5 to help out with a checkmate on h7, right? But it doesn't mean that white has no attack here. White can actually go rook f3. We call that a rook lift. And the rook is coming over to h3 with quite obvious threats of checkmate. And, you know, I would say for a beginner, this is a very difficult combination, right? Because you first have to sacrifice a piece. You have to see quite a few moves ahead. And then you're not even getting like a checkmate right away. Then you play rook f3 and you're like still two moves away from a checkmate. So you have to really believe that that checkmate is going to happen, despite the fact that it's not coming by force. Um, and of course, there's things that black can do, like moving their f pawn. They can try to give the king and escape square and two f7 um but ultimately yeah white does win and a big part of their attack is also that at the right moment their bishop can come in through a threat so we don't need to get into the details here too much but yes that is a move that white could have already done which just you know kind of testifies to the fact that when you play nice active developing moves put your pieces on good squares take the center, you're already going to have great opportunities like that. But white played f5. Okay. So yeah, that is the point of, you know, it, moving your pawns is that they can keep on moving and open up more opportunities, clear the way for your pieces, really. So after pawn takes, well, you have to take the pawn, right? Because if you don't take a pawn like this, it will keep on moving and drive its way into black's position. So I think you got to get rid of it. And now we had a couple of peace trades. So we can see uh, both sides are castled. Yes, but uh, black has a lot of sleeping pieces on the queen side. While white has this bishop, you can't really call that undeveloped, guys. That is important. What I was saying is like a bishop is a half developed piece, even from its starting position. Like look at these opportunities, right? It can hit things very far away, even though it's never moved. So there's really no urgency to move that piece. The only urgency is if you plan to get the rook in the corner into the game, which of course is a good idea. So black gave this check. Now black's position is so desperate, guys, that black perhaps should be just playing a move like that um, just to open up the light squared bishop. Now that move does lose a pawn because white can capture on passant right? But at least then you get to trade these bishops and white's bishop on f5 was an extremely good piece. And you can somehow play knight c6 or knight d7. Um, it's not good for black, but at least black will not get mated. But black gave a check, right? So yes, this is the typical um, 
stuff again that beginner players really like to focus on, like where are the checks, even if they're not particularly effective, like in this position. White just moves the king to h1 and is absolutely safe there. So then black finally develops, attacking the pawn on e5, and white decides to develop the bishop to guard it, and black tries to attack it. And here, guys, experienced players will feel that they have a very powerful position, really active pieces, and they should be doing something aggressive, right? Not just defending that pawn. I think that is maybe one of the biggest differences, guys, between you know, someone who's played chess for a long time and someone who is newer to the game is how do we respond to threats on our material? So for newer players, it's like, oh, they want to win my pawn, right? And that becomes the focal point. While to a player who's played for longer, they're able to look at this position and understand that, that there are things here that are simply more important than that pawn. For example, like our bishop pointing at their king, right? And we can uh, take advantage of that with queen h5. Um, yeah, threat of checkmate is always better than defending a pawn. Now, for example, if they fork us, we go back. And the idea is now their dark squares around their king are super weak. We still have a dark squared bishop and we're going to use that to mate. So let's see if we can, how are we going to make this checkmate happen? Actually, pretty easily if they take our bishop, like check, king h8, queen f6, king here, and then we can actually use the rook. Why not? Bringing in that rook um, as the final piece of the puzzle and the checkmate is just going to happen. So black's king is very open here. That's why you always need a pawn shield in front of your king and you don't want your king looking like this. So white did not go for this aggressive line. White played here. And this is, again, very typical mistake in thinking, right? Where you prioritize small things like a pawn over bigger picture things like a possible attack on your opponent's king. And black keeps on trying to attack it. And by the way, in this position, black can again try a move like this. I think this is a very important kind of opportunity because you really want to open up that bishop. I can't stress that enough, guys, when you've got those sleeping pieces, how much of a priority it is to get them into the game. And um, yeah, there's no time for en passant here because you're going to lose your bishop. So um, if we trade, well, that would be a dream for black. We would be so, so happy if white agreed to that trade because white just lost their attacking bishop and is helping you develop. So that's, that's of course, the problem in wasting time, guys. When you play a move like rookie one, you are giving your opponent a chance um, to get their pieces into the game, right? And so d5 would have been really, really an effective move. Although, of course, um, yeah, I mean, white can still consider possible sacrifices on h7, king h7. We already saw a very similar idea, but the problem here is that even though your rook is coming in, it can't, it can't really go to h3 because of the bishop, right? So black might just be all right here. All right, but black did not go for this move. They're still trying to win the pawn, right? It's the focus on material. And now white played queen d6. I found this move to be very interesting, guys, because normally when you have a position with the initiative, you don't really want to offer up a queen trade. But I think white judges this, judge this correctly because if black trades, then the e-file opens up and black's coordination on the back rank is so poor that even in the end game, white's initiative is huge. I mean, if black trades the rooks, there's always this threat of checkmate 
on that square. So the queen trade is not a bad idea. And black says, nope, I will take the pawn. Okay, so black is now up one pawn. And now white makes a quite significant mistake. Uh, this is the last piece not in the game, guys. And given that there is no forcing direct win, uh, you know, no checks or captures or threats that are really good, like this, you know, this bishop sacrifice, which is always hanging in the air, isn't really working right now. Um, so what we do in a position like this is we bring in our all of our pieces, like making sure that every single piece is playing. This move should be very easy, guys. Just finding that one piece that is not yet so good and centralizing it and for sure that will be useful down the line. But white does make um, a typical kind of mistake, right? Using the wrong rook. I'm not sure why they're choosing to use the rook that was already doing something, but in a way, maybe they're trying to entice black to take that pawn. Maybe that's what it's about. And actually that's what happened. So black took the pawn and white went back, pinning the knight. And there's only one way to guard it. And this is um, the position that we were trying to get to. So white has some very nice opportunities here to take advantage of their superior development, their superior activity. And I think a lot of people at least from the students I've given this position to, um, still would find it a little bit hard to put away black in this position. You know, first of all, let's try to understand what the target is. That's actually a really important question. I've had students here who think, you know, that this kind of move is a good idea, right? They think the queen is the target, but no, the queen can just move away and then the move doesn't really do much. So what do you guys think is the target in this position for white? You can stop the video and think here, but I will tell you it is the king. Why not? Uh, the king is the biggest target we can have in chess. Uh, black has some very poor development and we have very active pieces and their king is a bit exposed. So that is the first thing is to select the right target. By the way, guys, the point here is not to win a pawn. We're not trying to, let's say, win back the d7 pawn, right? Like we're not interested in any lines where, you know, we try to capture that pawn. Um, like even if we could, because that means we're trading pieces, we're trading off their bad pieces. So most definitely not. Like we have one target and it's the black king. So what's a logical move given that? It's the move queen d5. Yeah, of course, checks. The first moves that we should always look at. Perhaps they will be effective. So now the black king can go in two directions. Uh, f8 or h8. So now the black king can go in two directions, f8, or h8. And the problem, of course, with this move is besides the fact that you're kind of moving into the center, is that you lose this pawn and uh, the attack is just unabated, right? Your king is still in big, big trouble. So king h8 is the natural move. And this is the part where a lot of people get a little stuck because they're like, well, what was the point of the check? Like the king just moved away and there is, there's nothing. But actually, there is something. And yeah, this is where my students, unfortunately, did not um, play with enough conviction and they started, you know, targeting the queen instead of targeting the king. This is actually a really big mistake because it allows the black queen to pull back, offer a trade, and then within just a couple of moves, like white's initiative is just completely gone. Right, black opened up his light squared bishop, they're threatening a bishop trade, and that's kind of it, guys. So, of course, if you play the wrong way, you can just be down two pawns and with nothing left of your initiative. So what is the right move? Well, we have a very pretty move here for white. Again, good uh, point to pause the video and think about it. 
the move is queen f7. So yeah, when I saw this as a possibility, I got really excited. I was like, wow, that's very nice. <laughs> you know, very logical, very pretty. Uh, we are putting our queen under attack using um, a very basic and important tactical theme, the pin, right? The queen cannot be taken because it's going to be a checkmate by the rook on the back rank. A very common way for people to lose when they start out in chess. And this queen move is also threatening the rook, so there's a big tempo, and the rook can go to either g8 or d8. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter where they go. They're going to lose um, either way. The key thing to remember is that your queen is under attack. I think that's also easy for people to forget. It's like, no, there's no more pin on, uh, on the knight anymore, and the knight wants to take your queen. So what do we do? We take the knight. And we are not taking it, um, you know, to uh, just trade pieces. We're taking it to get rid of possible defenders. And then we simply play this move. It's a very nice little move. Actually using the poor position of the rook on g8 because it's going to be taking away the king's exit. So if the king takes, we go queen h5 and it's a checkmate on the side of the board. Uh, meanwhile, well, I mean, their rook can move away somewhere, but the king's been completely opened up and uh, a king like this gets, gets mated very easily as the pieces just invade. So if the rook went the other direction to d8, uh, let me just find that moment. Here we go. Rook to d8. We actually do something very similar. We take their knight. Pawn takes, and then we find that h7 square. This time we don't sacrifice our bishop first. We go with the queen. There is no block with the pawn because we're just going to take it. it. The h pawn is pinned. And if they go here, that allows us access to g6. So one thing that I really want to highlight here, guys, is that do you notice how these pieces have never been allowed to move, right? That is not an accident. Um, that is a sign of a successful strategy that we've been putting so much pressure to block, playing with tempo, checks, threats, captures on every single move that black has simply not had time to attempt, um, you know, to move his D pawn, for example, and open up that bishop. So now he's getting uh, faced with a threat of checkmate. The only option is to flee. And now you want to just ask yourself, like, what is going to be more productive? Just a directly attacking the king with checks, like obviously that is a super tempting move, or perhaps trying to take away his exit. It's a slightly more sophisticated strategy. And uh, personally, if I don't think that queen h7 is going to be a forced checkmate and the king is somehow fleeing, I would be very tempted to play a move like that. Just bring in one more attacker, make sure that once the king goes to the F file, um, there are going to be checks by the rook. Discover check is a very powerful concept in chess, guys. So that's how this game can finish up. So that is what I found really attractive, guys, about this position is that with very forcing moves, very kind of logical uh, moves that are focused on the target, white can bring their uh, initiative to fruition here. So um, yeah, it's not every day that you get to finish off the game, you know, with moves like queen f7, putting your queen under attack. It's very attractive. And I think um, that's basically all it really took for white is focus on development, um, active play with the pawns, control of the center, very important, um, opening up files, and then finishing off an attack um, with forcing moves after having identified the correct target, right? I guess that's a lot of things I actually listed, guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, eventually, you know, you can start putting these things together in your games as well. So hopefully that was useful to you guys.